Ladies and gentlemen, if you thought the Liverpool away game was intimidating, just wait till you see the Joe Willick Derby. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Black Man Twitter at Yankee Gunner. I hope everybody who celebrated Thanksgiving yesterday had a wonderful day and ate way too much. Um, I have a confession, and I think this is a safe space. It has always felt like safe space, a supportive space. So I'm just going to go ahead and make it early. I don't like turkey. I don't like turkey. Paul let me have it in the WhatsApp, um, and he had a really stinging rebuke of me, but he used the wrong version of your. He did a Y-O-U apostrophe R-E when he meant Y-O-U-R. And like, once you do that, like, have you ever seen the meme? It's the Achilles meme with the arrow in his ankle, and and Achilles is the well-crafted argument to defeat a stranger on the internet, and the arrow is a typo. Yeah, you can't do that. Once you do that, you're dead. So I made a confession. I was rebuked. The rebuke had a typo in it, a a grammatical error, if you will, and so I win. I think that's how that works. But this is a long digression. This is a bit of Arscast-style waffle, I think you might even say. To allow me to say that I love you and, and I'm glad you're here and that I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving or just a great Thursday, whichever it is, uh, that brought you health, prosperity, and overeating. Because that's, you know, that's part of the good stuff in life. And here to celebrate with me is the man who did try to rebuke me, uh, although with poor grammar. Paul, you can find him on Twitter. Pause my pants. Hold pause. <laughs> Hello. Um, like, you didn't really explain that I, like, it made sense and then I edited my thing before I hit the button and I switched, like I was trying to do it gently so I didn't attack you. So I changed from, uh, you, I don't know what I was saying, but I was attacking you. Uh, you're an idiot to your radar is off or something. So it went from you are to your radar. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that I just don't know how to spell your, it's that I didn't proofread the change. Well, anyway. I, I'm going to level with you. You sound like a man who indulged yesterday. So I, I saw the picture of the turkey uh, that you conquered. It, lo- it looked wonderful. So congrats on that. I stuffed it, but good. Yeah, you you texted me that you had to go stuff the bird. And I, I don't. Yeah. Clive is on Twitter. Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Without getting us in trouble, can you say that in England without getting in trouble? I'm going to go stuff the bird. Stuff my bird is, I think, what he said. Is yeah, that? well, you said it now anyway, right? So, but um, I mean, like, but like, because to us that just means I'm going to like no one in like. No one in America would think twice about that. But is is that a thing that if you said it in England, you'd be in trouble? Um, <laughs> All right, let's move on. Maybe. So we're going to do a Newcastle preview today, um, and we're going to probably keep it pretty tight to that because the game is early, a 6.30 a.m. kickoff for me. But for those of you um, in the region where the game is played, it's a 12.30, I think half 12, right, right Clive? Yeah, I think 12.30, yeah. 12.45, one of the two. Something like that, yeah. Um, so not a lot of time to get this podcast in, although it is required listening. There will be a live stream today, but the odds that you will be able to catch it by the time you're listening to this, 50-50, but it will be at 6 p.m. UK time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, and then just Google what all the other times are because I'm I'm not Google.com, although I wish I was because then uh, I could still do this podcast, but I could do it for my private island. Anyway, this has been Extreme Waffle Edition of what was supposed to be a tight 45 minutes on the Newcastle preview. So, uh, Clive, let's just start with the bounce back thing. It, it's This game takes on a sort of interesting new narrative now in the wake of the takeover. Everybody who faces Newcastle is going to sort of want to get one over on them before you stop being able to get ones over on them. I think more than ever, everybody is invested in seeing them go down now because it delays the threat of the new money coming in there. They do get a new manager bounce. In fact, this is going to be new manager bounce week for Arsenal because we we face United with the interim manager bounce. But Newcastle can't defend for Toffee. So it should be a really interesting game. you got the Joe Willick angle to it. How, how do you think psychologically the team will be approaching this coming from a, a fairly stinging loss but with a a really, really good game to get right uh, in front of the Emirates faithful. Yeah, we normally do quite well against Newcastle, and no matter what we're doing, we do quite well against them, so Mm I've now jinxed it. I think um, one one look at the league table, they conceded 27 goals. It's good. Even when they played Brentford the other week, um, they conceded three goals and three all draw. So they seem to be a little bit more attacking and free-flowing in their 3-4-3, but... They concede at the back, you know, and the players I have at the back, Lascelles, you know, Clark and Fabian Shaw. Well, I quite like Fabian Shaw, but you, you need to you need to make sure he's on a tight rein. Um, there's chances there, right? 
there's chances there, there's space down the sides. Their wing backs in particular, like Guy Ritchie, I don't think is a wing back. I call him Guy Ritchie, I'm sure that's not his name. <laughs> but Ritchie, he's not a wing back. Uh, he's more of a midfielder, they play out wide and they should be playing Jamal Lewis out there, but they don't. And so Murphy's not bad actually. So they they just a bit leaky. As for us, I think we are we seem to have a a better feeling about us. Even post the defeat, some of the noises coming out of dressing room were really quite positive. We went a bit quiet in the club and since the interviews this week, it just feels like everyone knew what that game was. Mm. I'm hoping that we learned from it. And it's still only three points, right? It's just three points. But it's only just three points if you go and make sure you deal with the next game. And I think that's the most important thing. Sometimes uh, the 5 0 defeat at City felt quite bad. We had two weeks to think about it. But we could then recover ourselves with new signings and new shiny toys and have a look at them in the Norwich game and then go from there. But this time we have Newcastle, bottom of the league. We should, it's so important to just deal with them, you know? And I think mentally, I just got this little feeling just based on some of the words going out of the club that we're in a better place to approach the game post the defeat. Whereas historically, I always felt an Arsenal come out of the back of a, a good run. They tend to lose two or three before they get back on it again. But I'm hoping we can bounce back straight away. Yeah, I think the interesting thing here is just the chaos that Eddie Howe is going to bring to Newcastle. And I was listening to, I think it was The Athletic, uh, did a podcast talking about Newcastle Arsenal game and, and the Eddie Howe chaos approach. And he might make them more dangerous in attack. They have the weapons to be more dangerous in attack, but defensively they are so flawed. And I find that to be an interesting type of opponent for Arsenal, Paul, because we don't attack well and we do defend well. And so I, I guess the question becomes, is Newcastle the perfect opponent or the worst possible opponent in the sense that do you think their weakness at the thing that we tend not to be great at will benefit us? Um, because I, I I feel like this is the perfect get-right spot for us. Yeah. So I think they'll be a really good opponent for all sorts of reasons, um, including the primary amongst the reasons them not being great. Um, they could be good to begin the game. Uh, they got the new manager bounce. They got the. They've been working on some new stuff. They come out feeling good, but uh, I might. I don't know if I disagree with your assertion that we're not good at attacking, um, but we're good at defending. Um, I think we're good at attacking sometimes at the moment, and that time happens to be right at the start of the game, which is the most important time to unhinge Newcastle from their newfound training ground vibe, the Eddie Howe new tweaks and and things. So I think this still sets up good for us. Um, the needing a response from the Liverpool game sets up good for us. Uh, like we hopefully come charging out of the blocks, do our thing. Uh, you know, we can score goals quickly in a burst, when the energy is high, we're pressing. It becomes a little more challenging when we're not full on going full bore. We're not pressing. Mm. It's not an attacking press. Um, you know, it pr probably if you segmented how we play lately into times when we're, uh, I'm, I'm going to be generous to us, times when we're trying to score and times when we're not, of course, we're always trying to score. It's just uh, there's a big drop off between when we're front footed and when we're kind of trying to uh, finesse our way. And so I think this could work out okay. Um, I mean, I, I generally with Newcastle, things work out okay for us. And I don't think anything sizable has changed here. I think there's a, like, even when you read the response of, say, the media, and like, now that we've calmed down a little bit, the, a little bit the social media response, I mean, it's still been pretty qu critical after losing. Apparently, we don't like losing, so, uh, but I think we knew that. And when you look at the response of media around the club, um, watching the presser with Arteta, I think we're getting better and not losing our shit when we lose. Mm. Um, and there's a sense that... To some degree, we're still building. So I think we come into it with a much better um, 
a mind state than we might have in previous times when we're not quite sure we're heading in the right direction. Now, I know not, not everybody's sure we're heading in the right direction, but uh, when you average it out, there's generally, I think, a better feeling will come into this willing to respond and all about the response rather than who are we, are we, are we any good, are they still behind us? Um, I think it could be a good game and it sets up well for us. We'll start fast. Uh, be interesting to see if we'll start with Lacazette or Odegaard because uh, obviously you change something significant in how you set up. Um, maybe he wants to start. Uh, I know a lot of people think Odegaard will come in now and I tend to too, but maybe he'll say, you know what? We need one more fast start. I'll bring in Odegaard on 50, 55 minutes. I mean, even in the Liverpool again, game again, when I watched Lacazette, I mean, you can almost, almost set your watch to about 25 minutes in the first half. He'll start looking like he's gassed and not be able to press the same way he will. So that's a, an interesting choice for the yeah. manager. That's I the think bit, possibly the big choice, yeah. Yeah, well, I think this is a game... Look, you have to win every game in the Premier League because it's our only competition that matters this season and these are games you have to win. But this is an interesting game for him to try something because mm. we play Monday, Thursday, Monday... Uh, pardon me, uh, Friday, Thursday, Monday. And it's United away and Everton away are the next two. If he thinks maybe I need to go back to Odegaard starting or I need to go to this or I need to go to that, this is the game he kind of needs to find out how he feels about it. You know what I mean? Um mm. If he starts Lacazette in this game, which is totally fine, I just can't imagine that he's going to go to Old Trafford and make a major change to what he's doing for that game. So if he if he has an inkling that maybe it's time for Odegaard to come back in and start for any particular reason, and I'm not saying that what you do at home to Newcastle is indicative of what you can do away to United, but you need to at least get a look at it, I think. So I, I would submit that any major change he wants to make to what he's been doing the last couple of weeks you better try it now uh, because away to United and away to Everton. I'm not saying Everton or United are any great shakes right now, but those are those are certainly harder games. You'd want to get a look at it. And I know there will be some people, by the way, that say, Elliot, you've said that Newcastle can attack and they can't defend. They can't do either. And I realize that on metrics, they are the third worst defense um, on XG. They are dead last in goals allowed, but they are second worst, I believe, in uh, attacking metrics. But I, I think that sort of is impacted pretty heavily by this run, this this final death rattle before they made the manager change where they had 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, and 0 0.2 expected goals. And it's a run that included, you know, Palace, Chelsea, Brighton, Spurs, Wolves. I mean, not an easy run, not the hardest possible run. But if you look at games against like Watford, Leeds, Southampton, West Ham, and then this past one against Brentford, they did create a decent number of chances and they do have attacking players that can hurt you. So I, I think some of their attacking metrics are a combination of a tough run where they were abysmal and ready for their manager to go and maybe stopped playing for him to the extent that that's something that you can assess. Clive, let's talk about the lineup a little bit. And one of the big decision points, I think people sort of assume that it will be Kieran Tierney coming back for Nuno Tavares. You and I did a first half rewatch of the Liverpool game, and I was sort of dreading it. And honestly, even though I thought we were pretty good in the first half when I watched it in real time, I thought we were even better in the first half on the rewatch. Now, there are going to be people listening who haven't rewatched it, who hated the Liverpool game, and are like, here we go with the apology. Look, the second half was abysmal. The game was bad. One half doesn't make a game. I'm not trying to hand wave losing 4 0 to Liverpool, not remotely. But you watch did, that first you, half and you see. Did you yeah. rewatch the second half? Uh, I have not rewatched the second half. No, I. It, I, it, it is actually. A, it, it's a bit like the first half. It's better the second time. Um, well, yeah. It, it has some terrible mistakes in it, but. A, a lot a lot of what I think went wrong in that game actually does boil down to individual errors more than yeah. systemic failure. But I, I think where I was going with this, Clive, though, is specifically as it relates to Nuno Tavares, because. Nuno Tavares made the error that made it 2-0 and put the game beyond us. And he almost made another error like that. Those were errors of carrying the ball out and you know maybe a little inexperience, doesn't scan, doesn't check what's behind him. But in terms of what he did defensively and some of the stuff he did in that first half that we rewatched, Nuno Tavares was good. I mean, if you had to pick a man of the match from the first half at Liverpool, and it's a bit thin gruel, I, I get it, he would have been a candidate. So do you just assume Kieran Tierney comes back in here? And if he does, how do you feel about that? Because... I think a lot of people would be shocked if Tavares kept his place. 
But after sort of rewatching that half, I certainly wouldn't have a problem with it, you know? Yeah, I think um, with Nuno, when he came out, drove out of his hole in the first, on the second goal mistake, he knew there was a player inside. But then the picture changed and he didn't look again, you know, so he knew he was there. But then he drove out and it was just very difficult for him to find him and he, he misplaced the pass. Player misplaced his pass. I'm, I'm not too bothered, really. I think his mistakes mm. came from a good place. I think they really did. If I, if I just brought this out a little bit earlier, I think with the games upcoming, you know, against um, you know, like May United, you know, we've got Everton away. I think we've got Leeds away as well in the month of December. And suddenly the fixer list looks a bit compacted. And so I almost don't want to say either or for certain players. I think there's three or four players that are quite close to the first 11. And Nuno's one, Ainsley is another, uh, Odegaard and Pepe. And those those four players, we better start loving them because we're going to see them in the next two, three weeks. Right? And, and of those four players, Ainsley's in a good place, right? You know, Nuno's in a good place. As Kieran Tilly comes back in, it doesn't matter. He's going to play in most of these games. He's going to end games or he's going to start games. Odegaard, I think, has realised he needs to step his game up. And so the one that I think is a real sort of conundrum, and I think it's a player that we really need to do well, is Pepe, really. And I mm. think Pepe is the biggest... Um, if you you know, if you ask me and say, Clive, you know, name a play, let us sit down and talk to you for 10 minutes, Pepe would be it. Because I think he can do things, but he's about also... About politics specifically, or... <laughs> yeah, what? politics, you know, you know, social social justice, that type of thing, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, because he's got he's got potential, you know. We all know his numbers, and we know his goal, goal involvement numbers. We shouldn't dismiss that. Much like we shouldn't dismiss Kieran Tierney's ability to do the right thing at the right time. It's, it's, a, it's a factor that we, we sort of miss, you know. And, um, and you had credit Shaka into that as well when he's back fit. And these are the four or five players that really do make up the squad, you know, that make us feel the levels are not dropping. And Nuno was unknown to us until until this season, obviously. And I think Ainsley's really surprised a few people. But we need these people to come in because the burden on some of our key people, particularly, I know I keep saying this and people are bored of me saying it, but I am massively concerned about the burden on our two Hell End boys I think it's too much. We just need to take them out. We need to feel confident we can take them out on a particular day. I think it's really important. I'm watching them fading games and people are talking about our creativity numbers and our attacking numbers and our big shot chance creation. I'm thinking, yeah, well, who owns this show? Right? It's these guys own this show and they're, and, and they're young and they can't always sustain it. I know they're the golden boys and I know they... They hold all our dreams. They're, they're doing what we'd all like to do. Right? But we also got to protect them and we've got to nurture them. And it's people like Pepe that are not allowing us to do that. You know? Mm -hmm. Nuno can come into his team and play off the left-hand side. No problem at all. Martinelli, I can hear people screaming. Needs to be more consistent so we can do what's right by these players. I, I don't like them being overplayed. I think it's very important we, we don't fall into that trap because we're seeing jaded creativity, jaded, big chance creation. We are so reliant on Saka to break the game open. We're so reliant on Smith Rowe to do the final, that final thing in the last, in, in zone 14 when a cutback comes. I want other people contributing because the string of fixtures we've got coming up, mate, this, that first level can't carry us. I absolutely know it. And we need that. We need to see these guys step up, which is my biggest sort of worry at the moment. You know what? That's a really interesting point you made about jaded creativity and jaded attack numbers. Like, I get that there's been some persistent challenges with the attack that stretch back, you know, not just this season, but the last few seasons. But there is something to be said for adding a, a new element or a new spark into the attacking part of the game from time to time. And... You know, Manchester City, they have a lot of stars, so they can rotate players in. But you, you keep a Sterling coming in, a Mares goes out, a Foden comes in. You know what I mean? And again, if you have that luxury, then of course you do it. But you know what? Liverpool, Firmino, Jota, like there's a, there's a, a little bit of change they can make there that has a little bit of a, a different dynamic and sparks things in a slightly different way. Obviously, um, at Chelsea, they have all those sort of different inside forwards, whether it's Mount to Pulisic and 
um, Havertz, right? Uh, you know, they can go with Hudson Adoy. They have Werner and, and Lukaku and ways to change it. And some of that is about quality. Yeah. But Pepe is a quality player. And, you know, Martinelli, I think, is a quality player. And there is an argument for just saying, look, we are every week asking Saka and Smith Rowe to go out there and be the creativity and be the spark and carry the ball and make the chances and get on the ends of chances. And they're young kids. And like, maybe you bring in a, you know, a 27 year old Pepe and, and just change the dynamic a little bit, change what the opposition has been looking at on tape for the last five or six games when they do their video review of what Arsenal do. Um, I think that makes a difference. Share the responsibility, make them accountable. I, you, you, I, you know, I watched a game when Pepe didn't play well again. I think it was Palace, and and I saw things that really bothered me. But that was a long time ago. I right? bring him back in. We need these players. We we need them. And I, I just don't believe that you can go from playing most minutes to zero minutes, right? And you know, I watched Martelli play, and I think he spends too much time on the extremities of the team. What I think he might you- start tomorrow. I think you he think? might start. Uh, you we'll know what's come. interesting? If you look at the Arsenal.com, and this is this is pure like uh, reading tea leaves speculation. When you look at the Arsenal.com headline stuff, training pictures is the main headline right now. Yeah. And the very first training picture is like a a happy Arteta and Martinelli palling around one. And yeah. so, of course, I'm just like totally reading the tea leaves there. But I, <laughs> I wonder if he wants to inject something. And as you said, Smith Rowe in particular, he's played yeah. a lot. He played for England. He's been through a lot in the last several weeks. Maybe just give him a break. You know, exactly. so he's fresh for old trap. Exactly. And I think it's if you said to me, you know, in the first block of games, it was like, oh my God, what's happened? <laughs> Zero points, three games. Then we go into the recovery side of things. And we ended up in a, with a great block of games, major in a month. In the next two blocks, in between, the, in between the international breaks, now we come to this block of games. In my head, I'm thinking, what we want to achieve, so it's points accumulation. We've got some away days we need to do well in, in places that we don't always do well in. And now, I think number one thing we need to achieve is we need to find a couple of people. So we need to find, we need to find Martelli or we need to find out about him. Because in January, we've got a couple of strikers disappearing. We need to rediscover Odegaard. We need to discover Pepe again. Because we are not going through this next set of fixtures with Saka, Smith Rowe, Lacazette, and Aubameyang. It ain't happening. You know, it just isn't happening. We need to refine these people, rediscover them, get them back on board, re engage them into the group. And then we can look at the squad a little bit more and how we start and end games. I think it's the most important thing for December when. You know, we get the we got the Carling Cup game coming up as well in the month. You know, we've got to find even another couple of defenders. We've got to find our holding again. You know, it's very important we do this earlier because in a game when you're starting to when the things start to squeeze up, we sort of got used to no football in the week. We'll soon start to see people cramping and going down and picking up injuries and missing yeah. training. And it'll mm-hmm. suddenly become apparent, mate. So that's my sort of mini goal in my head for the next three four weeks. Yeah, and I, I think with the African Cup of Nations coming up, like, do you want to suddenly need a Martinelli or suddenly need an, an Odegaard or suddenly need, a, you know, a, a player of that type? And I'm I'm sort of spacing on who some of those other players are going to be and you haven't given them any minutes. I, I don't think you want to be in that position. So, Paul, I, I, it is a tricky one, though, because you could tell me that any of Martinelli, Pepe, Odegaard, Tierney, even Maitland Niles maybe are going to come back in to start, but he's not going to make that many changes. I mean, just because we regard Newcastle as a winnable game doesn't mean any game is easy in the Premier League. And they do have a new manager, and there, there's a little something about them. A three-three with Brentford recently shows that they're feeling frisky. Um, so, is there a right change for him to make to maybe just inject a little bit of of energy and spark into this without making too many? Like, what what do you think is the right balance there? Um. Well, you're right. You can't make too many changes. I guess my reading on it is not the... I don't think the lads are jaded yet. I think, obviously, Saka's making his adjustments from... um, He he might be the one that has maybe more mental and a bit of physical fatigue just from the rigors of the summer through to now. And he's played almost as much as Smith-Rowe. I think we're... We're just a little nervous and touchy because we don't have our the attack fully firing and we're kind of flailing around for for reasons. I mean, these guys are playing once a week 
And I think the issue comes next, as as you've alluded to, that they're about to be jaded if we don't do something about it. So I don't think the urgency is there to do it right this game, but to start right this game. So it may just be getting a Martinelli or a Pepe in for the last uh, 30 minutes or 35 minutes, bringing somebody on at 60 minutes or 55 minutes into the game. Um, and I'd start with Pepe because to me, Saka, you know, he ju- he had the longest season of any of our players last season, the summer, uh, all the emotional hangovers of how the tournament ended. We brought him back early because we needed him. We brought him back into, um, I think we, didn't we bring him back into the Brentford game because it was going so badly? I think that's the one he stu- he came in on as a sub. So right from the start of the season, we were in trouble and we brought him back in earlier than he needed to come back in really. Um, so he'd be the one. Get Pepe going. He's been the closest one to to firing. So I wouldn't mind Pepe starting in this game. That would be the start I'd look for. Uh, but certainly bringing him on super early with an eye to uh, weaving him into our starting lineups more often. But I'd, I think I like t- if I was following your plan, I'd start Pepe and I'd bring Martinelli on after uh 60, 65 minutes, so they get a Pepe nice on the right instead, instead of, of Saka. Saka or, yeah, okay. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, just a, a straight swap. Like, I know Smith Rowe and Saka didn't have the most eye catching games against Liverpool, but that was Liverpool, a bit like uh, Brighton was, but that was the weather. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a soft excuse for why they didn't shine a little brighter, but um, they've shown. Uh, certainly Smith Rowe's been shining brightly and doing his business and he did have a couple of moments in that game where, where like that back heel flick you remember the one in the first yeah. half through to Alba where Alba was offside would have been an absolutely eye-catching goal and it tells me the spark this is my reading of it the spark's still there um, he's fine rest Saka get Pepe going bring Martinelli on for Smith Rowe uh, on 60-65 minutes um, and then you got your e- either you start Odegaard or you uh, you start Laka and maybe give give the other one twenty five minutes when yeah. you swap them around. <clears throat> I, I guess is... you also got to work Tier- Tierney into the mix here somewhere um, if if Nuno starts or if it's the other way around. You don't want to freeze Nuno out for the reasons we talked about before. It'll look like. Uh, he's been punished now. They've had a week in training together, so they're probably all fine and dandy. And like as we all know, Nuno actually had a pretty bloody good game in in many patches. But um, look, he's he kept Tierney out of the starting lineup. It tells yeah. you everything you need to know about what the manager thinks of him. And maybe it was a game too far for him, just in terms of the the tension of the situation. He responded very well in some ways and made a critical error in another. I, I think. You can drop Nuno now and bring Ta- uh, Tierney back. And as long as the manager's saying the right things in his ear, I don't think it's a problem at all. Um, I would be very surprised if Tierney doesn't start. I just think as good as Tavares has been, Tierney is the first choice in that position. And I don't think his start to the season was so catastrophically bad. The other thing is if you want Tierney to come back and take that position back, rather get minutes in his legs against Newcastle than have his first start be at Old Trafford. So I think he will come back. Clive, I think this warrants a, a, a bit of a deeper dive, though, on the Odegaard situation. The, mm. you know, the, there's been a lot of very positive noises about the summer transfer business for obvious reasons. Tavrez, we didn't expect him to play much at all. He's been sensational. Sammy Lakanga, one for the future, sort of, one for the present. Now, he crumbled under the pressure second half against Liverpool, but in general, I think we've been impressed with what we see from him. Obviously, Tomiyasu and White and Ramsdale all come in, all start, all been very influential and important. And by and large, I think everyone's feeling pretty good about the direction we went, the ages, the players, how they're performing early on. The one sort of interesting thing here is Odegaard was maybe the the crown jewel of the summer in terms of the position he plays and the what we see as the upside of talent. You know, that's a part of the pitch that gets a lot of attention, right? You buy a really good right back, that's fun. But you buy that playmaker who plays between the lines to create chances and score goals. That's a that's a headline kind of acquisition. 
And to be in a situation so early in the season where basically he loses his place to a striker who won't be with us after this season, who's basically got to drop in and play a hybrid 9-10 role because the guy you bought to play that role maybe wasn't giving you what you want, it's not ideal. Now, I think that sort of overstates the extent to which Odegaard was doing anything wrong, but it is definitely a reflection of the fact that Arteta saw something when Lacazette was coming on, the way he was playing, and I, you know, I think the Palace game was maybe a catalyst for that. But I'm, I'm sort of curious where you stand with the Odegaard situation right now, because ideally you'd like that guy to be locking down that position for which he was bought over a want to, not a want away, but a, a departing late prime striker. But we are where we are. So do you see Odegaard coming back in this game and taking that position back? And what do we, what do we need to start to see from him? To, to really establish himself in the role for which we acquired him. I think what we're seeing is a trend here, aren't we, uh, with um, with Nuno and with Lacazette in particular, that they were doing well, so they grabbed their places. And it didn't really matter who was in that place. They did well, so they played. Just pure okay. meritocracy stuff, right? Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Ellie. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. I'm not, I'm not one that's... He's desperate to be comfortable about the first eleven. I'm I'm much more focused on how we're playing and what the performance trends are, right? So, and if I do look at, you know, we spoke at the we spoke on Liverpool game rewatch game. When I do look at Arsenal, I, I I do worry about our build up. You know, I worry about what we do. You know, I'm happy when it goes into the goalkeeper. I'm happy when it goes into our centre backs and we split them and and then we make that first pass. And that first pass normally goes to Saka or or Lacazette, right? So, and then we normally set it, and then we spread the play, and we go that way. We go out the other side, but that first, I call it almost phase two build up. Right, that phase two build up, I think, is the biggest improvement opportunity for us. And and the players we asked to do it, you know, our two youngsters and Lacazette and Odegaard. I think they lack a bit of presence on occasions. They lack, they lack a bit of zip. I think our two kids are brilliant. They're, they're escape artists, but they can't do it all the time, every minute of every game. And so we need something else in that interior, in that lane four, lane three interior. Odegaard's a player that almost is the player that gets it back once we've done, done the build-up, and then he gets us going. He starts conducting us, and he can switch the play, and he can... He can change the point of the attack and he can also find little five-yard passes by creating a lane for himself. But he almost needs a body to give him that ball. And so I said, you know, I said earlier, I said that we, from a striker position, we've got Aubameyang and um, Lacazette and we almost want a hybrid of those two players to be our centre forward. And I'm starting to wonder now, in number 10 position, we've got Lacazette and Odegaard and do we need a hybrid of that player to be our true second striker, number 10, if you see what I mean? Build up in that second phase is the improved opportunity for me. We all know we'll eventually we'll have a new point of the attack, a sprinting centre forward. We've got a number of youngsters that can play in those attacking mid roles that just need time on the pitch, whether at Arsenal or on loan. And I include Balogun in that as well, who can also play off the left inside and not just a centre forward. So we've got some players developing in those roles, but I'm worried about that point, that 10 point, and what that point looks like. It's almost like Odegaard is here before we're really good. And another thing that I think is another secret issue that's de- developing here is that people will give you space when they're concerned about your threat on the exterior. So the exterior of our team is basically Saka, Aubameyang, and maybe Smith Rowe running in behind. Now, Smith Rowe likes to come to the ball. Aubameyang is not carrying the same fear factor from stretching the play as he did five years ago or three years ago. And so he's trying to be more of a team player and working a lot harder off the ball, but stretching the play and running past people and over the top of people, it's not really his game anymore. He's much more of a team player than he was when he arrived. And Saka is the only one that stretches on the other side. So we're a little bit, we're, we're a bit easy to squeeze. And I'm worried about this in Newcastle are now squeezing the play a little bit. We're easy to squeeze which forces our escape artists to be on point all the time, which puts pressure onto our passing accuracy. So I'm looking at Arsenal, and I'm not worried. I think what's happening is the best teams have highlighted where we need improvement. But fortunately, on Saturday, we're not playing the best team. So we can have a look 
and, and maybe you know take our lessons from Liverpool and really start to apply them. But that's what I'm looking at, mate. And Odegaard needs to be a little bit more assertive, I feel, Elliot, to go back to the original point, mm. to remind us all how good he actually is. And I think he's a very good player. He just had a little dip post in dash break and lost his place. And, and that's fine. Fight back, mate. Fight back. Can, can I ask you a quick question about that? Just stay with you just for one second. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's any relationship to the party being out? Because the one thing that occurs to me is when you don't have yeah. Thomas Party and you have to play Sambi Lakanga and Maitland Niles in midfield and then you throw Odegaard in there, it feels young. It feels a bit lightweight. Not that Maitland Niles is lightweight, but you know, you bring a Lacazette in there and you add a little now experience a, a yeah. little bit of expertise in, into that air, structure, into that area of the pitch, a, a little more robustness. Whereas, you know, you bring Odegaard in there when Party's back and Party can be that guy. Do you think there's any any thought of that in Arteta's mind just in terms of the dynamics of who's in the middle of the, the pitch in terms of age and, and physical composition? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Paul's going to say it if I don't say it, but just what's, hap- what's, what's happened to Odegaard this season? So we, we tried him in the double pivot and we tried him in an eight deep didn't we for a while we moved him about yeah, a bit that, that game was a d- disaster for didn't, him. didn't really work, did not work no. he got a little knock post international break came back didn't do so well then got dropped we've also lost a major pivot in Granite Shaka right so having that pivot there allows him to float and be himself right so so you take that pivot out and Lacazette's almost replaced that pivot role does it mean so? You mm-hmm. he suffered maybe because of that injury. If 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 it's Shaka and Party, who are our best, most experienced partnership that we have in the whole team, then he can just come on the pitch. I'll go over here. I'll go over there. Give it to me. I'll, I'll knock it around. And we're not looking at anything else. We're not worried, are we? We've got our structure. We've got our men, and we're not worried. So Lacazette's come in. I said this before that he's almost replaced Shaka in our team from a from a structural point of view gives us that dad in the middle of the pitch and allows people to rock around him. And I think Odegaard maybe suffered for Shaka's injury. When Shaka comes back, I think he'll be fine. And he needs to be fine tomorrow, by the way, but he'll be fine. We'll be we'll be able to see his normal game a lot more, shall I say. <clears throat> yeah, I... Well, Paul, I don't, I don't want to shut you out of that, I, but we don't need to go too much longer. Do you have a thought on how the structure of the midfield in terms of the available players might have played into Arteta's decision with respect to Odegaard, if, if you think that's a part of it, or purely that it was a meritocracy, Lacazette came in, made a difference, kept his place, and, you know, is it maybe time for that to change? What's your what's your thought on why we wound up in that situation? Well, it was definitely this... Look, we hadn't figured something out because Lacazette came in and bailed us out in a game or two. Um, So that tells us we were still scrambling for something that worked. Um, And Odegaard was in the mix, but we were using him in ways that even Arteta said didn't work for us. uh, The one where he played in the three, where he's... The thing was, when we played him in the 4-3-3 to the left of Party, I think it was Party, as I remember the game, um, we used him more as the pivot and we had Smith Rowe on the right. Um, so like when one of them dropped back to to be the second pivot with, with party because that was the, the kind of game state at that moment, it was Odegaard. And like uh, I would much prefer him in a 4-3-3 where he had that Smith Rowe role. Uh, why not? I, I understand why we played him on the left, being a lefty, and he could spin that ball up the wing to the the overlapping fullback or whoever we had up in the corner there. Um, But uh, he's generally always, in any setup he's ever played, played in the right half space. And I would have played him there in a 4-3-3, and I certainly wouldn't have had him as the the other pivot when we were pushed back a little bit or when we were battling in midfield as the, the... sidekick to party have him as as the slightly freer of your three in your midfield um and you know what was arteta's critique of why it all went went wrong um he said those players specifically odegaard weren't suited to playing in transition and the game you know it was a started to go ding dong back and forward and he was getting run through and run past like he's just not He's not the guy in the three that is the the next closest to being a pivot. He doesn't have the physicality. He doesn't have 
the le- he has the legs for pressing across the opposition's back line while they're trying to play out, but he doesn't have the legs, the physique to to be a a true midfield CM. And it was a misuse of him. My, my take on Odegaard is I think he's going to be totally fine. His the only problem with Odegaard is he still needs to prove that he's got end product in the box that he'll yep. get into the box like Smith Rowe. He had that goal, Obama Yang nicked off him. Um, but that would have been his second goal of the season. Maybe we don't, maybe he's on track. You know, it's such a small sample size. I'm going with Odegaard's good. We haven't really played him in position. Let's start playing him in position. But Lacazette took, the, took that spot because we were still trying to do unusual things with Odegaard and we as a team hadn't found our formula. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a problem with that because, to your point about it being a small sample size, that it that is a really challenging thing generally because even a season can be a small sample size depending on what kind of data you're trying to collect. But this few games into the season, where you, I mean, after the international break where we you know with the transfer window closed, it was a couple of games. Then Lacazette was in. Like that's it. So it. it it really is entirely possible that Odegaard comes back in here, the the he gets that place back long term, and he goes on to be fantastic there. So I don't think we want to rule anything in or out. I do think it is interesting how this has developed. And, you know, it's an early challenge for Odegaard because the one thing we can say last season on his loan is that pretty much when he was available, he played, played pretty well, and was influential in us being good during the periods where we were good. So he arrives, he's a, a big money signing, he's sort of, I I would say, the star signing of the summer, unless you you look at Ben White that way, but I I think it's hard for a defender to be that. And he's lost his place to Lacazette. And maybe that's a good challenge for him to overcome and just sort of realize that it's not going to be easy. Right, Paul? Yeah, uh, and like, I have an open question on this, but uh, I know you've questioned whether he drops in deep too much and Clive talked about the second phase of play and you know he wants to do illegal things by combining parts of players together again both as an attacker and now he wants to do it with He's Odegaard the gene splicing it's crazy yeah yeah Just it's not it legal <laughs> in America Clive might be okay in Britain but you can't do that stuff in America okay get um, back to your maybe, maybe it was sheep they can clone sheep yeah. like, get back to your drinking and eating <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, I th- I like now th- I can't prove it. I'm not certain of it yet. But I like Odegaard dropping in, dropping deep. I think he's super clever. Um, this is my picture of it, and it's been a while since we've seen him playing well and doing this. But I think it's very much part of the formula. I think we'll very much see it. I think he'll very much be good at it. Um, so that's my bet that actually he's really like you want to see him in midfield you want to see him doing what de bruyne does when he's up and then he drops in what um what's his face uh silva at at cities does in yeah, terms of he's dropping like a bernardo in. silva isn't he almost yeah, like yeah. that i think Buzzing that's really around, good. joining the dots then uh laying it off in what looks a fairly simple ball but scanning looking Making the like, I just think he's super smart when he drops in, makes a pass, then goes back to his ten spot over in the uh, the half space on the right, and the ball comes back to him, and starts the conducting thing. Clive talks about, yeah. and that's my picture of him. I c- it could turn out that when he's got a longer run of games, that's not how it pans out. But that that's that's what helps me sleep at night with Odegaard. I think he's good at that particular pattern, dropping in connecting with the pivots and and the full back on the right, uh, playing out and then moving back to his 10 spot to orchestrate when it gets into the third phase. Yeah, yeah I think I think we um, he misses a pivot, mate. He, I could yeah. see him playing well with Lacazette, actually. You know, I know we, Aubameyang is undroppable because he's our skipper, etc. You, I, you remember I, me saying that uh, the, the problem is they don't let us play enough players on the pitch because I want exactly like you. 12. I don't want to surgically combine players. I just want <laughs> to have more players on the pitch than I'm yeah, playing. So exactly. Clive, Clive wants to break the laws of nature and you just want to break the laws of football. football so, I mean, yeah. It, just, yeah it fixes yeah. everything, right? We can have 13 players, right? But I think um, I think he suffered for the Palace game. I remember it now. Um, 
we played that midfield three against Palace, with Party, Smith Rowe, and Odegaard, and yeah, yeah. Conor Gallagher and McCarthy kicked us to death, right? And Miller Kovic, whatever his name is, they they kicked us to death, and we and we reacted to that by bringing on Sambi, remember, bringing on Sambi, and then bringing on Lacazette, and and we found something else. Right, we found something else on that day, and then we yeah. went with it. We have to remember that I always say this to people. Or I talk about this every single week with, with the coaches I'm involved with, the manager I'm involved with. It's a constant search for balance. We talk about selection all the time: who's standing with who, what the partnerships are. You know, it's not it's not a crime if someone looks a bit sharper in training than you, and you lose your spot. It's what the game is, you know, and. And that's 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 competition. That's and we want this, right? We want good players competing, not bad players. And we're sighing when they come on the pitch. Do you know what I mean? We want good players looking at this. I think there was a game recently, the, one, the game you mentioned, Paul, when Odegaard came on and had his goal scratched off. He looked brilliant when he came on. You know, he looked absolutely brilliant, which means he's thinking, "I want to play." You know, I want yeah. to play. So this, this is exactly what we want, right? And although we want them all to play, they can't all play every single week. Yeah. There will be times we have to sit and we have to accept it. The most important thing is we have the right quality that comes in. Our season doesn't derail like it did last year because we lost a left back. Yeah, you know? That can't happen, mate. That can't happen. You know what I... So the thing is, I don't want him dropping deep. I don't... I For me... That's not him because you look at the way Lacazette does it when he drops deep, puts his backside into someone, pins a player behind him, right? Gives us a wall pass and, you know, digs out a pass under in traffic. I don't, I ne- I don't see Odegaard ever being that player. You know who you and I were purring about on the Liverpool side of things when we rewatched that Liverpool game? It was Diogo mm-hmm. Jota. And, yeah, and yeah. I, I want Odegaard doing some of that stuff. Jota was popping up in such good spaces between the lines, and we had such a difficult time tracking him. And that, to me, is what Odegaard can be. And, and he's even said he did an interview with Guillaume Balaguer. I reference it a lot where he says, sometimes I'm too drawn to the ball, and they've been working with me on you know staying up the pitch, staying in this half space, staying in that half space, you know, be available. That's what I want him to do because I don't see him ever doing the Lacazette thing of dropping in, putting his backside into a guy, and digging out different. a pass to get us going. There are different ways of playing the position. Yeah, he does. He, he bounces right. He's, he's a bounce board. Uh, he, he he understands the game. Trust me, he'll be absolutely fine. The Jota thing is really interesting, Elliot. And we, everyone talks about Liverpool's like a four three three, but actually they play almost two systems, right? Where they play like a, a four diamond two. Really. Yeah, and Jota yeah. pops into that, mm-hmm. but then he becomes a centre forward as well. I mean, I I rate that player so much. When you get good, mobile, tactically intelligent, flexible players, you can do multiple systems within game. And when Jota brings the intensity as well in the press. He's a great signing, a great signing. I don't know that, that little pun out they're doing, didn't they? <laughs> great signing. <laughs> and I I think I think Odegaard is another one of those tactical, flexible. Conductor of the orchestra, and I, uh, the the better Arsenal get, I think the better he will be. You know, he, he, I think he could he could play in City's midfield and absolutely technically deal with the ball and deal with their rotations and deal with their positional play. Easy, easy, easy. We need a bit more oomph from him, a bit more end product and goal scoring. And as soon as he does that, we won't be looking anywhere else why right? he just needs a yeah. little bit more time he'll get well, there, he'll get there. M- maybe the thing that's going to ultimately unlock odegaard is getting that more hybrid striker that we need in the summer or maybe even in january Hang because on. to be fair because lacazette is doing half of oba's job right now he's like okay oba you kind of run off the shoulder of the last defender get near the box i'll put my backside into a defender and win the first ball for you well if you've got a striker doing both of those jobs then you can have a player like odegaard between the lines a little bit more but we need to play both lacazette and Aubameyang to make up the one striker we wish we had. So Paul is, is there systems are always about partnerships and, you know, look at the role Jota plays or Firmino plays. Well, the reason they play it that way is because they've got Salah, uh, uh, Mane and Salah on either side. And the reason we've been finding this system is because maybe we don't have exactly the qualities in the striker we want. So, but, 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 but for me, Odegaard is not going to play the role the way Lacazette does. That's not his game. No, uh, but he's a, when he drops in, he's not going to, to to your comment, he's not going to have his backside against a player or a defender or a midfielder. He's always going to drop into space because he's the free player. He can do that. And like the Jota comparison, I, I think those are really interesting comparisons, but they're different systems. So 
he's the third forward um, with three midfielders behind him. So he doesn't need to do what what I'm talking about with Odegaard. Odegaard needs to do it because we've only got the two midfielders. Yeah. He's, the thir- mm-hmm. he's the third midfielder. That's why he has to drop in. You want Jota between the lines the way you talked about. You want Odegaard dropping in. It's more the City formula where you got Silva who will drop into midfield. Yeah, maybe that's De- a better point. Yeah. De, Bruyne, De Bruyne who will drop in. Like, And I'd almost say uh, if he's not good at it and if you don't like him doing it, we've got a problem because that, to me, is how this system works. If if Odegaard isn't dropping in, we're kind of screwed if he's on the pitch. That's I think we're going to see it. That's how he plays. I'm sure his idea of moving to the war- towards the ball too much and ours might be a little, you know, it's like expert level precision that he's unhappy about. I don't think he really means. It's always been the way he played from, from the games I saw from before. He'll always drop in. He'll always do that job. And uh, I think, I've seen him doing it well, I think. That's, yeah. It's been he's a, a high, while. Oh, sorry, yeah. Paul. Go ahead. He's a high-touch player, right? So yeah. my coaching message to him would be, what's your starting position? So in some of those games when he was in the 4-3-3, I thought he was too low. He was too deep, too early. and found himself in defensive positions he didn't want to be in. But when you are up higher up the pitch, you actually want to be a little bit higher, and then you roll in as the ball's progressing. Right, so his starting position in the first phase is really important to him. I think we've messed him up a little bit by playing him deeper, although I did really like it. I think at Burnley did it really well, but I think Tim made a great point that Burnley missed out midfield. So he's basically just standing in there and getting on the ball when we had the ball. So against a two-man midfield, so it wasn't a problem for him. And it but suited Pat- him because he could then press their their back. Like he's, I saw a chart yesterday a good chart, not a bad one, that he's the most active pressing player in the Premier League when you combine uh, amount of running plus number of pressures. He's r- he's right up in the top bunch in terms of total number of pressures per 90, and he outruns all of the bastards. So, Yeah, he's going to uh, be fine. Are we, are I think we, that's just, why he was just, good against Burnley. Just a little, just a little tweak. He's just a little tweak. Starting position, get on the ball. Mate, I want you to have the most touches. If you're the most, if he has 80, 90 touches, we're, we're in business, right? Because he's accurate, he's secure, and he, he knows how to find people at the right time. His timing is excellent. We just have to develop towards him, I feel. You know, and we need a bit more stability behind him to allow that. And uh, yeah, he'll be absolutely fine. I think we need to add, we need to show a different face offensively. And if, if I'm the manager, I'm thinking, okay, we're not looking so good in those big chance charts right so scott did a great chart about where where we are at the right game state what to how many goals we scored and where we sit then and i think yeah that's a much more representative but Was we all good? know this. were we good we are good <laughs> I, i'll tell you mate, that boy that boy scott knows his onions i've got to say mm. he gives a lovely balance on the data he doesn't just say the what the, the hot topic is he looks for game states he looks for moments and we look much Dibs. better yeah. Much better. Um, that's I'm, I'm not going to sit here while we just praise Scott because I'm, I'm not here for that. You know, <laughs> that, that guy already knows how good he is and we don't need any more of that. But I, you've teased something out of me here, you sons of bees, because I think for months now I've gone, without saying anything inflammatory that's going to blow up my mentions, you've teased it out of me. The more we talk about what Odegaard is and how Odegaard's going to play for us, I have to admit I have always in the back of my mind wondered if he was the right guy. Because if you look at, you know, forget Liverpool, we're probably never going to play Liverpool's system. But even if you look at City, you know, these these teams that are at the top of the game, they play a 4-3-3. Now, I realize formations are nothing because, play, you know, where does Cancelo play if they're playing a 4-3-3, right? Like, what's he do? Um, you know, when you look at the, the, the pass to Kyle Walker for the, the cutback against PSG that leads to, is it the winning goal or the equal? It's a winning goal, I believe, um, against PSG the other day. What formation or system is that? Um, you know, and they had already changed it three times in the game by that point. But unless Odegaard can be our Bernardo Silva, unless he can play like that Jota, where he drops between the lines and gets into the box and the end of things, he I, I don't ever see a midfield three that competes at the top level that has Odegaard in it. I don't see that. The days of 4-2-3-1, where there's a 10 between the lines like we played with Ozil, I just, I think that is gone. 
And I don't know if I believe Odegaard will be a mid in a midfield three. So he, I think he has to become either one of the wide players who plays occasionally instead of a Smith Rowe or a Saka, or he has to become that sort of new hybrid nine thing that, that's played kind of like what Bernardo Silva does, where you're more a facilitator and there are other players to get in. And, and that's not to say Odegaard isn't a great player, because I think he is, and I think his ceiling is high. I'm not sure who he is in modern football and how we're going to get that out of him. So I, yeah, Clive, you want to come back? Cause yeah, now you've got me putting on my whiskers hat. There it is. That's my worry. <laughs> Tell me why I'm wrong. No, I've had the same worry. And the people that follow me on Twitter, I, I posted out three uh, number tens that can play inside and out. Right. And they were all six footers because that's where my head is at the moment. I, I want a bit more presence in there. Right. So I think I put Slobosai, Kulisewski and, Brazilian guy at Leon uh, Paqueta, I think his name is. Mm. Inside and out, six footers, sent, given the ball, Santi Gazzola type, it's disappeared. You ain't getting it back. All right. So, so, in my mind, I'm thinking the same in it. But what I realize is, is that Odegaard is also a player that we need. And we, and we, we mustn't get fixated on, on that first 11 group. We want a group of attacking mids that bring something different. So Odegaard is different to Smith Rowe. He's different to Saka, the way he wants to play. And those three I mentioned are different to all of them. And it's almost like you want a group of players that bring different skill sets, but are tactically flexible in the interior and the exterior. So I think, I said, I said earlier that I think when we're not quite ready for Odegaard yet, we're not quite good enough. Does that, mm. does that make sense? When we're really good, when our centre midfields are monsters, right? We haven't got, we haven't, you know, you know we're just a little bit better, and that centre forward is scaring people, creating space for him to play. Then I think we're going to see, and uh, we're, we're going to see, and we're going to be, we're going to be so reliant on him. I think he's got the potential to lead our offensive unit. That's where I think he could be. But where we are right now, there are some days where we need to sit him, you know. And, and Anfield would have been one of those days, you know. Mm. But Watford at home, he, he should have started, right? He should have started that game without a doubt. And we were probably have a different conversation right now. Yeah. I mean, can he be our, our, this is the problem, right? You look at these teams that are great. And then you say, can he be our blank? And the fit, you fill in the blank by saying the, the player who's great for them, that he looks like he can be our Odegaard is what he can be. What I'm wondering is what is that thing? Do we want to mature to a midfield three? Like a lot of the big boy football clubs are playing right now. In that case, is he in that midfield three? Does he have to find a role in a front three, in in a role that's a little more of a hybrid, which, by the way, is all the rage right now, so no problem there. I It, it is a slightly awkward fit, and I guess when I look at like a Smith Rowe, I see a guy, Paul, where I'm like, you tell that guy to go be in a midfield three, and he'll take to it like duck to water. You know, I mean, he will, you, you can see him get into that part of the pitch and be aggressive and mix it up and play. Maybe I'm wrong. Like, maybe his desire to carry the ball in every situation would be bad if we dropped him a little bit deeper. So I, I might be giving him credit that doesn't fit, but I Odegaard has the talent to be excellent. Does he have the profile to fit where we're going? And maybe that's a worry we don't need right now. Cause I think like in a game like this against a Newcastle, this can be the perfect game where he pulls the string. So Paul has a uh, final, you know, final thought on, on the Odegaard cast <laughs> that we're doing. It became the, um, yeah. yeah. Odegaard Um What, what do you think in terms of, Odegaard being very talented, but us still needing, and him still needing to figure out where he fits into a modern sort of big club system. Yeah, you see, I think the 4-2-3-1 or even in a 4-3-3, Odegaard can work, but not the way we used him before in the 4-3-3. He needs to be the freer of the three. He probably needs to be on the right, but I'm not too hung up on that. But let's say Smith Rowe, and Odegaard happened to be two of the three with party behind them, and Smith Rowe developed a little bit more physically. Or let's say we signed Basuma, and between Basuma and party, they were two of our midfield three. Kind of one of them was Basuma was more like your your Gigi Wijnaldum, uh, hard running, hard charging, good on the ball, good passing. Not we're not asking him to be super creative, even if we think he can be, and. Uh, parties the deeper in the V or vice versa. Like you can make an argument for either way around on those. Yeah. But the third guy is Odegaard. And that's your V in midfield. 
Perfect. That to me will that to me will work. And like with our four two three one, it's not super four two three one because as soon as we split into the the five lanes uh, at the top, it don't matter. We've got uh, Nuno or uh, Tierney on the left, Odegaard towards the right. Our four two three one is not. It, it it's fairly skewed, and it turns into what what a city would do with their structure, uh, with you know, with two guys in the half spaces, which is probably Odegaard Under on the right and Smithrow on the left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. like just it's balance. just different ways of getting into the final third. So, and I think in both scenarios, if Odegaard is as good as we project he can be, and we've seen seen glimpses of i don't think he's just a really good squad player who plays some games i think he can play in either of those systems depending on who the other guys we bring into the team or it, it, we're perfectly fine to go four two three one now as we've seen before with him and you know he's he's just the guy filling in in that uh channel on the right yeah, I mm. think I think Paul's absolutely bang on there. I think what you should have in a midfield three V, you should have a six, you should have a box to box, and you should have a playmaker. And he's a playmaker. So what we did against Palace, we had a six, it was really an eight, and we had double tens that yep. started high and dropped in late. And we got botched in centre mid. Right? So and gave them a false control. And so we learned from it and he suffered from it. So Odegaard needs to play, but the balance needs to be right behind him. And that's what's, and he suffered. That's Amen. all it is. So, so it's all good. All good. Mm. Well, I, for one, am glad that we had this podcast about Martin Odegaard. <laughs> <laughs> it's about midfield. I'm not any idiot, to be honest. It's about midfield and build up and what we do in certain phases. So it's I, I liked future. it. I liked it. I hope everyone else did because I liked it. <laughs> well, we're not we're not done yet. The Odacast is over, but we still got a few things to pick out here, a few things to clean up. And speaking of which, you know what really needs to be cleaned up? Like the one thing that I, I think we oh, can all agree in heaven. needs to get cleaned up is not God in heaven. I'm sure God in heaven has a lawnmower 20.0. <laughs> But you have the Lawnmower 4.0, and I command you to get it. Look, it is Black Friday here in America, and if anything says Black Friday, it is talking about products that you need to buy at steep discounts. Well, you can get a steep discount when you use the code ArsenalVision at checkout. Go to manscaped.com, use promo code ArsenalVision, save 20% off, and get free shipping worldwide on the finest instrument that God in heaven himself has ever made, even though he's on the 20.0 and we're only on the 4.0. It's like, we'll get there. It is designed to get your body properly groomed that's it that's what it's designed to do ingrown hairs nicks cuts these are the things that happen when you use bad tools but when you use good tools you get a good outcome right when you use martin odegaard the way martin odegaard is supposed to be used you get goals you get assists when you use the lawnmower 4.0 you get a clean freshly shorn body that is the envy of everybody who sees it which hopefully is a lot of people that you want to see it and they will be impressed. So what's good about it? Waterproof, long battery life, different guard sizes so you can do different parts of your body. Ceramic blades, you better believe it. That's right. Ceramic blades, skin safe technology. It is basically the finest instrument ever created for the purpose of making you look freshly shorn. It can't do topiary, but it can do your body and you should get it. It's Law More 4.0. Only at manscaped.com. Promo card submission, 20% off free shipping. Clive, enough of that? Enough. Yeah. All right, this was meant to be, the headline of this podcast was originally going to be the Joe Willock Darby, and we're going to have a nice chat about Joe Willock. We're now an hour into what was going to be a one-hour podcast, and the title of this podcast has been changed to Odacast, okay? For reasons that by this point you are well aware of. But we're still going to touch on, not each other, uh, Joe Willock. Clive, the Joe Willock situation is one that can be used for point scoring, but I don't want to use it that way. I think it is... Just a reminder that in general, when we are decisive and we take good fees for our players who haven't clearly decisively proven that they are a fit for us, that tends to work out fine. In my wildest dreams, what I would have liked is for Joe Willock to go on and really be excellent for Newcastle because he's an Arsenal kid and you want to see him thrive. Um, and of course, he's going to score two screamers against us. So, you know, we know that. But Joe Willock has not thrived. Joe Willock has been really, really bad, admittedly, for a really, really bad team. Joe Willock has no goals and no assists. He is 10th on Newcastle in expected goals per 90. He's like 12th on expected goals plus assists per 90. 
He's close to dead last in terms of the number of passes he's completing per 90, attempting per 90. His dribble completion is terrible. This is not me kicking him. He just has been very, very bad for them. And it is sort of a cautionary tale about small sample sizes and hot runs and overperforming expected, you know, expectations on, on the metric side. And he was a player that for us, even if there was some argument, and I made the argument that he had qualities that were interesting, those late runs into the box. When you get a good fee for a player you haven't been able to really find a fit for, you take it. Is it is it a little bit disappointing for you to see that Joe Willick hasn't thrived? I mean, I but but on the positive side, and again, not to take any delight from his his poor performances, to really just be validated in the fact that the club was smart, did the right thing, made a good choice that was best for you know what we need to do in our project. I think um, it's again. It's, we 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 spoke about Odegaard. To mention his name again, but really, what we talk about. My God, he's gotten his mileage on this one. Already. <laughs> Leave the man well, out of it. What we talk about is mid, in midfield balance, wouldn't we? Really, and the, what what that looks like, how we can control games, how we can build up, etc., etc., etc. Right. So, what happened to Willock last year? Well, they played like a a 3-4-2-1 towards the end of Steve Bruce's reign, shall we say, at the end of last season when when Joe was scoring goals. And basically it was him and Sam Maxman behind Callum Wilson. So Callum Wilson, just in a triangle there in a point. So Sam Maxman as a carrier. And Joe was allowed to just do anything he liked. He could charge into the box. He could go deep, make tackles. He could go and join in. And if it's a running race, big distance, well, good luck staying with him. Right, so whereas now I mean I've only been looking recently because we're playing them. They're playing a three f- four three with Joel Linton playing up front with Sam Maximam and Wilson as almost like three strikers playing high, trying to pin people. And Joe Willis now part of a double pivot. Well, we know with our Arsenal heads on, he's not a double pivot player, is he? He's not a six and a half, shall we say? He's more an eight and a half that runs away and shows you your shorts. So again, because of a balance change and a role change, the player's lost. You know, So he's lost to them. If they set him free and say, go on, son, get out there, run, drive, make tackles, transition, get up behind our you know, two, two strikers, two forward players are going to be lazy and stay up and go and join in and arrive in the box. We know he can do that. So his role's changed. He's now standing still, knocking the ball sideways. That's not going to work for him. He's actually going to look crap. And that's why we sold him, because he's a specific player that didn't have the tactical flexibility that we require on any given week. You know, So that's why I think he's been a bit unlucky. That's my read of it. And I've only been looking at Newcastle recently, so I may have missed the start of the season, but that's how I see it so far. Yeah, and I mean, look, they are a bad team playing poorly and – as a result, like he may have just been wrapped up in that, but even by their standards and and within their team, he's been poor. That may change now. Um, and for his sake, I hope it does, but not tomorrow morning or tomorrow noontime where the game is actually taking place. But Paul, I mean, these are, these are the interesting thing. I'm trying to think about players that we made the difficult decision to sell where we went on and got burned by it. And like, I can't think of any. You know, everyone mm. point to Serge Nabry, but that wasn't like we chose to sell him. We just let ourselves get into a bad situation because of the timing of his injury and a bad loan decision, and so we didn't have a choice. There's Danielle Malin. You know, there's a, there's a couple of guys that have gone young kids early in their career where you know they hadn't made it even into the first team yet. But if you look at actual first team players, I mean, other than maybe like Cesc Fabregas, like Adebayor, Nasri, Van Persie. You know, Van Persie went and won a title for United, but let's not forget. One year later, he was unusable on huge wages. Alexis Sanchez, you know, we should have sold him earlier, fine. But, I mean, Alex Song, we were sort of sorry to see him go at the time. Alex Kleb, we were sorry to see him. And then you get more recent, Alex Awobi and and Joe Willick. Like, it, there aren't many we've been burned by. And a lot of people, by the way, are going to pull me up at the Van Persie thing. Again, yes, one year later, he wins United the title, being the player of the year in the league. But a year after that, he's unusable. And if we had re-signed him and, you know, one year later had a player who was unusable, that might have been more damaging to us than it is to a club like United. So I, I we don't need to relitigate that. And there it is on the bingo mug drink. But, like, I, I think it's it's just worth clarifying that so people don't scream at me through their device any more than they already have when I was uh, making my inane comments about Odegaard. So, yeah, thoughts on 
just generally the, the decision to sell Willick, what's happened for him, and maybe a positive reminder about making the right decisions, the hard decisions, but the right decisions? Yeah, yeah. No, I think you you framed it exactly right. I wouldn't really, uh, unlike me, I wouldn't try and tink around the edges of that. Uh, <laughs> I was delighted that we, I, like, I think you, we can recall that I was one of his boosters in the early days. He had a great preseason. I thought he might contribute to our season a couple of years ago with Unai Emery. He went, he went on and contributed in 44 games in one season. Um, I've always seen things in Joe Willock that I really liked, and I was delighted we sold him. Uh, buy low, sell high. Like He was scoring goals for fun. It wasn't supportable if he were messy and he wasn't messy. It was absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, it is interesting when you see the discussions that come up on social media with 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 people who don't see that and like it, he must be the poster child for buy low sell high kind of thing yeah um he we didn't really need him we have smith row i know they're they're a bit different but i'd have given all joe willock's minutes to smith row in the season when he played 44 games for us if smith row had been ready to play um like they do somewhat different things um but but you you can basically achieve the same things with Smith Rowe on the pitch. Um, we didn't we needed the money more than we needed the Willock, and you know we sold a Wobi. Uh, we got some good use out of him. That was the right thing to do and take the money. In large part, we sold Oxlade Chamberlain, who has his days, who has his games. We took the money. This was good money for players. We should have taken the money for Maitland Niles. That would have been really good money for him. Um, in this market, if you're getting 20 million for somebody like Joe Willock, you don't blink. Um, unless he's a core player that you know is part of your formula going forward. Um, absolutely everything for selling that player. And uh, we got that one right. And if the market allowed a little more, maybe we'd have done a player or two more along the way that funds what we're doing, that gets you in your Nuno Tavares, uh, your, Sa I mean, Sambi Lakanga. Jesus, what a gift that is. So you got to trade, you know, you can't play Monopoly and hold on to everything. You got to get in there and trade a little bit and, and trade up and upgrade and, and improve yourself. And even if a player is good, he may not be the piece you need. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> you you kind of work out who's in and who's out and it, it's it's a little tough at times, and it can get a little emotional, but it's it's what it is. Yeah, and as Clive always points out, there's players everywhere. Never get too yeah. attached to players. Like, yep. and academy kids, you have a right to get attached to. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you should have a heart. You should care about these guys. But what I mean is, how much have we thought about Joe Willick since we've sold him? Yeah, not a lot. I mean, how much have we thought about any of the play? You know, even Matteo Ganduzzi, who I like a lot, and I think he's talented, and I I think maybe that situation wasn't ideal for us. Like. I don't think about him. We're going to be fine. You know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. always players. In, in it, general, it only hurts thinking, when you don't have, like, I don't miss Matteo Ganduzzi because I got Sambi Lakanga. I'm fine. I know they're not exactly the same, but you know what I mean? You miss it if you don't have the player. We miss well, Van Persie because we lost Van Persie and, yeah. and took us for fu fucking ever to get in a striker who got us excited. Yeah, th this is the thing. It's not the selling. It's the not having a plan for what you do next. Yeah. Right? But but that's the point because if you're thinking about sacking a manager, you should probably sack him. If you're thinking about selling a player, you should probably sell him because it it demonstrates that doubt exists and that doubt probably exists for a valid reason. So the irony is, look at it the other way. Clive, look at it in terms of the players we didn't sell. We didn't decide to take the money and move in a new direction, whether it's an Eddie and Kedia, you know, Probably a mistake there, I think it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's an Alexis Sanchez, who we wound up swapping for a Mkhitaryan, an Ozil, who instead of selling, we decided to resign, and Aubameyang, instead of selling, we decided to resign. You know, you can go back through a lot of these. Aaron Ramsey, decided to keep him. Injury hit season, didn't get top four with Emery, lost him on a free, hasn't really made it in the Juventus squad on huge money. Like, it, most of these cases, if you could go back and say, we were thinking about selling, let's just do it. In most of the cases, had we sold, we probably could have moved forward 
more quickly, more effectively in the direction we needed to go. So is this just a reminder that first of all, once they're sold, the pain tends to be acute in the moment and passes quickly as you get excited about the new players coming in. And that that seed of doubt tends to be indicative of something that isn't a fit. So take the money and go in a direction that fits you better. Yeah, that's the yeah, it's pretty clear, really, to be honest. I do think we, we have made mistakes, or every club does, but I do think some of the stories that come out are not correct, you know, and I don't think I'll sort of totally stupid, you know. For example, oh, Ed, no Eddie, that, yeah. <laughs> Eddie Eddie and Ketcher was, was was able to go, goes into negotiation, after two months wages, we he has he stays. So I wouldn't put him in that you know, in that bracket. Aaron Ramsey turned down many contracts, and then in the end, he didn't want to sign. Goes in a free. But and the summer happens. before he goes on a free, we had offers and we passed on. Uh, well, we don't know this. We don't know the that's story. True. And this all, is right. That's this true. is all what I'm trying to say. It's all speculation. We add it up. We add the sums up, and we say, you know, he, he, you know, he may have said, well, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to sign and stay on, you know, and then he decided, well, I'm not going to sign. You know, and then we we we're not in we're not empowered here. We got Callum Chambers also potentially going to go on the free transfer. I'm not sure if you have an option or not, right? So, Eddie, if he goes abroad, we get nothing. If he stays, we might get five, six, seven million quid. Right? Lacazette, we're going to get nothing for forty-seven million pound investment. There, are, it's 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 modern. It's the modern game. I'm not I'm not excusing the club. I'm just saying that sometimes players play the game. You know, they want to get their signing on fee. I think we all know if we can get good money and fine enough, the ones that we get money for sometimes are homegrown ones, you know, because they're mm-hmm. valuable to other teams and suddenly they're easy to sell. People want to come for Marty. There's a homegrown goalkeeper, 28 years of age. Yeah, we'll have him. You've sent him out alone, Arsenal, for the last four or five years. He's got experience. Yeah, we'll take him. We'll give you 20 million quid for him. So we'll, we'll give you money for him. You know, we, we're never going to lose. So it's it's just the, it's the modern game, really. Isn't it? So I think I'm I'm not concerned. I think we need to get better at this, obviously, because sometimes I felt we were lazy in the past. Alexis being one, we were lazy. We definitely missed some offers there, but we have done some better things recently. And I'd much rather focus on on that if I'm honest with you, mate. <clears throat> yeah, I I want to be clear, just because I think um, there's may, maybe you took something out of my comment that it wasn't intended. I wasn't saying it as a stick to beat the club with, like, look how dumb we've been in the past. It was more examples, and maybe not all of them are apt or applicable, of just the idea that in most cases, when we've chosen to make the hard decision to sell, that has proven right. And in the cases where we haven't sold, whether we had the option to or not, we probably would have preferred to have been able to sell. And it wasn't me saying, look how we screwed this up. It was more me saying that, I think in the case where doubt exists on whether a player is a fit and there's good money on offer for a player, probably take the money and move in the other direction. Yeah. Um, Because you're much less likely to get burned by that. Because really what you're committing is also time. Like the Shaka one is a good example because it's not the debate over whether Shaka is good or not good or we could have gotten in a player who's better. You're also committing time. You're saying that for the next few seasons – this continues to be the direction we're going. So it's resources plus time. And sometimes you have to just rip the bandit off and say, this is a direction we need to change if we're going to get to the destination we want to get to. And we want to shorten the length of time between here and the destination. So we're going to make this change now. And it may be uncomfortable in the short term, but we're not going to commit three more or two more, whatever it is, seasons to the direction we were headed. That That's really yeah, part of I, the calculation. I, well. I agree with that. I think... I'm I'm a lot more confident saying, yeah, let's do it, let's do it, based on the six signings we just done. Do you know what I mean? And I think we're more confident that if we were to sell a, a few players, that we actually buy some decent ones, <laughs> because which hasn't always been the case in, in the past. You know, we've we've um, we let people go for free and then bought people overpriced that haven't really done it for us. But it's it's an upward trajectory at the moment, and so. Yeah, if we can move a few on, we've got a few to move on in January and we've got maybe a couple more in the summer, there's a chance to reinvest. But I do think the club is much more focused on the wage bill. And the wage bill is something that comes out your bottom line within that year, whereas the transfer fee can be amortised, as you guys know. And I think they're not worried about that because money's cheap, we can borrow it. But let's get our wage bill down and that really affects us year on year and that then affects our... 
our share value, etc. So that's where we are at the moment, and I think that I think rebuild is well ongoing. The other thing there, Clive, is going young means we might actually be able to sell some players without them running down their contracts. Because yeah. yeah, let's take, say, Nuno. <clears throat> um, clubs are going to want him in two or three years' time. They're going to want him early. They're not going to want to wait till he decides to run his contract down. His his value will will increase over time. Like I think it's always been the case that there's an argument for going younger and doing this model. That's not that new. I think it's just the fact that players are running down their contracts more and more puts even more of a premium for the Ralph Rangnick going young, uh, building value and selling. And it's it'll be more the case than ever in the past that the only people who are making money off their players are the teams who've gone young and been successful with it. you got to do both um, because you're going to get more and more Lacazettes and Chambers. Anybody in the 26, 27 year range where you used to be able to sell these guys, more and more of those guys are going to run it down. But the players that better, bigger, richer clubs won't wait for are the 22, 23, 24-year-olds. They're those are players you'll get a, a significant fee for. So I think the market will change a bit and put even more of a premium on being good at buying young. Yeah. Since the Invincibles, there's basically one player ever that has left the club where I've been totally devastated and felt it was irreplaceable and that we would go on to have several years of missing him being there, and that's Cesc Fabregas. Robin Van Persie was washed after one season. Alexis Sanchez was washed when he left. Santi Gazorla, who we've never really been able to replace what he can do, but by the time he left, unfortunately, his body had broken down. You know, that that was a different issue. So in terms of players leaving, in what, 15, 16 years, I can point to one player leaving where after he departed, we really missed what he offered and he was great for a while elsewhere. It's just a reminder that these players can be replaced. That, you know, I mean, again, it's hard. It's hard to replace a thirty goal striker. It's hard, you know it's hard to replace uh, players, but um, most of them most of them can be replaced. So anyway, uh, that this is spiraled off into some interesting conversations I wasn't expecting. We got to go. I uh, hope you enjoyed the Otacast with a little side of squad building one hundred and one plus that nonsense at the beginning where we talked about the actual game we have tomorrow. But before I'm going to let you go, I'm going to get predictions. So Clive, what do you expect tomorrow? Three two. Mm. I think it's going to be high scoring. I think Newcastle are going to be emboldened with a new with their manager on the sideline. We may have to go for some trauma, but I think we'll outscore. Paul, three zero to Newcastle. <laughs> you, you're you're so excited by what you did with the Liverpool I, again. Paul predicted four 0 to Liverpool. No, really, give me your real prediction. If it is three 0 to Newcastle, by the way, you're kicked off the podcast for three uh, one to us. Three one Arsenal. Yeah, I'll say four one to the Arsenal. Yeah, I think. Uh, Maybe Newcastle will have more chances that they don't finish. I think it could be a bit of a back and forth game, but their defense looks real ropey. And I think we're maybe a little better than the new than the Liverpool game result suggests. I would love to see some Gabriel Martinelli involved. That'd be fun. I miss that kid. I think he's still talented. We'll see. All right. Um, we'll leave it there. There'll be a live stream in well, by the time you hear this. You will not be able to catch the live stream, but you can watch it over on YouTube because it lives there. That's how that works. So anyway, uh, lots to come. Instant reaction pod tomorrow, of course. We'll be starting some early transfer type stuff when we get in December and a couple of new uh, projects coming out. So in general, lots lots more ahead. And thank you so much for being here. We love you. Uh, Paul's on Twitter. Pause in my pants. Thanks, Paul. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. One of these days it's going to happen and maybe it'll be tomorrow. We love you and we'll talk to you after Arsenal 10, Newcastle 0. 